morning again. Good to see everybody. It's great to be here this morning. Man, we had a great early service, and it's good to be in the Lord's house and see some familiar faces and uh, see what the Lord has in store for us this morning. If you don't have your Sunday school books with you, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 11, 17 through 32. If you do have your Sunday school book with you, just have your Bible because we're not going to go through your Sunday school book. I just, I, I'm, you know, I just don't do it. But the title of the lesson is called Mercy. And the sub, it says the gospel continues to be offered to all people, Jews and Gentiles. Isn't that the truth? So let's get rid of our Sunday school book. We're going to start off, we're going to, you know, everybody does, does, does things different. I like to put myself inside the author, get in Paul's skin, feel what he feels, imagine his emotions and everything else. And to do that, you know, I love the way Brother Jim preaches because we go verse by verse. Our Sunday school lessons, they jump a little bit. So we're going to backtrack a little bit. We're going to go to Romans 10, 18 through 21 first. Romans 10, 18 through 21. And it says, But I say to you, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the worlds. But I say to you, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. <clears throat> but Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Sound familiar? Talking about us and the Israelites condition. And we're going to get in that some more in a minute. Then we'll go to Romans chapter 11, verses 6 through 8. Romans 11, 6 through 8. And it says, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks. But the elect obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Then also in Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 16. Oops. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you, Gentiles, insomuch as I as am, I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I might provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Okay. You know, we're gonna, when we get into our lesson, we're going to talk about a lot about branches and grafting. Grafting is a very unique process. You take a, a good sturdy root stock. A lot of these beautiful roses you see everywhere, they're grafted. They take a wild, tough, hardy root stock and they graft this other, this rose onto it that has a very weak root stock. And it becomes this beautiful, beautiful rose we see. Same way with fruits and, and other things and other trees. Same way with us. Just like Brother Jim was saying this morning, that new life, that new man, we are grafted in, cut away, so to speak. 
Think about one more one more verse before we go to our lesson. John 15, 1 through 6. Let's see what Jesus says about it. So I like to I don't like to use my own opinion. Jesus 15, 1 through 6. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. He talks a whole lot about fruit and branches. I want to ask you, what does your what does your branch look like? Is it full of heavy ripe fruit, or is it just withered, sitting there, using sap and not making nothing else? It's not up to me. Jesus points it out. So we'll get into our lesson in Romans <coughs> seven, uh, verses seventeen through eighteen. Chapter 11, verses 17 through 18. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Branches were broken off. Why? Due to a lack of faith. We'll get that a little farther down there. You know, and when he's talking about the branches, he's talking about Israel. Lack of faith, they were broken off. But you know, God is all seeing and all knowing. He's all always provided a remnant, right? And you wonder... Why would they have a lack of faith? Remember, Jesus came from the Jewish folks, right? You know, here's the, the new covenant coming again. But the thing that hindered them, that hinders us a lot of time, is tradition. They're hung up in the law. We put blinders on with tradition. I can't see. I suffocate myself because we get hung up in tradition. Be it in a church. Face it. It was, it was different this morning. We had service the first time in so many weeks. It was great. And we embraced it. We didn't get hung up on, well, this is the way we always do it. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You know, and he talks about the wild olive tree grafted in. You know, and I didn't know this. It's history on olive trees. Olive trees often lived for hundreds of years. And individual branches would stop producing fruit. So they cut those off and grafted on younger branches from younger trees to continue the fruit production. Sounds like what we're supposed to do, right? We are grafted in. We're supposed to, Jesus just told us, if you're in me, you're producing fruit. You're supposed to be producing fruit. Yeah. Why are we? I can say, sometimes I step on toes. But Paul's point is that the unproductive branches of Israel were broken off and the, that the wild olives were grafted in to take their place. See, God... God's Word, just like God's Word, it knows no boundaries. It's going to be fulfilled. And he's, He makes that perfectly clear. Because, face it, if you've come to that, that point, you've accepted salvation, you feel that, that urge, I need to 
preach, teach, whatever it is. Acts 1.8, go forth and tell. And you don't. God's word doesn't stop. He's going to raise somebody else up. Just like he does, did with us. He grafts us in. And then he talks about the root and the fatness. Whoo! I'm partial to that. <laughs> I resemble that. <laughs> you know, once we're grafted in, we partake of the richness of God's blessings as the spiritual heirs of Abraham. And I want to thank you about this. Some of the promises we, we covered on inheritance in the last couple of weeks, we inherit everything that Jesus Christ does. I want you to think about that. You know, scientists spend all their lives, millions and trillions of dollars, studying the universe. When I've got the inheritance of the creator of it, why do I need to study it? I'm going to be a part of it. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13. Pardon me. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that you once, <clears throat> that you once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, man. You know, that, well, that says it all. And then Paul goes on and talks about olive tree, because face it, olives, all the trees and olives were a big part of that culture and still are in that, that part of the world. A lot of, they used olive oil for medicines, cooking, you name it, they used it for it. Basically, it was, um, it was their Ben Gay, basically, like ours. It, but also, the olive tree had a lot of um, scriptural significance. Because it was the place of divine blessing where God's covenant of salvation was made with Abraham. But I want to ask you. And this is where a lot of people stray. We worship the, the tree, not the creator. We worship the building, not the author. You know, that's where we've got to be careful. And then he says, do not boast. Mm. There is no place in the church for spiritual pride. And still less for anti-Semitism. And think about it. When he's saying do not boast, he's talking about his countrymen that have been broken off and cast out. He knows what's happening to those. His heart is cut. He's, I mean, he's, this could be his, some of his family members, people that he, I don't know what kind of seminary school he went to, but they sat underneath the uh, rabbis and all that, some of his buddies and all that, that have denied the faith like he had once done, and he knows he's on the path now. So imagine the emotions that go through there. Cause, and I think a lot of it, and this is, this is part of me thinking, this is a freebie. When you ask for that thorn in his side to be removed, I, I think a lot of it was internal. The, just the, the strife that my people, my brothers, my sisters. And you know, those branches that are broken off allowed us access, me access. And it just, there's a, there's a group of people out there, they're all over the world that they take joy at watching people suffer. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Then he talks about the root that supports you. A lot of times we get this wrong. We are not the source of, the bl of blessings, but the recipients by the grafting into the covenant of salvation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do anything who, through Jeff who strengthens me. 
It's all about seven out, finally realizing, and it, us men understand this a lot because I can fix anything. Yeah. You know, you get that, that pride going. But you know what? That soapbox comes, you, you come off that soapbox hard and fast. God don't put up with it. In Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 26 through 29. Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And you wonder why... Why Paul has to say, well, do not boast. Well, he says it because he knows what's going to happen. That pride comes in. Well, well, look at me. I'm better than those Jewish folks that follow all that tradition. I've got, you know, put it to bed. Take it away. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. We're all sons of God if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Nobody can't put yourself on a ladder. Nowhere. Then uh, back to our lesson in uh, 11, Romans 11, 19 through 21. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you. Woo! You know, it says it all there. Shows right, right there, God is an impartial God, right? He is a just God. He's a forgiving God. But that's all he asks for is faith, right? The branches that were broken off and grafted in. Those are the ones that, with no faith. And those of faith are the saved, right? You know, a lot of people have that misinterpretation of faith. There's a whole lot of folks out there right now that are on the river and everything else. And I'm not saying that going to church, being in church on Sunday, brings salvation. It helps guide me and grow me and, and opens my eyes to what God has in store. But there's a whole lot of folks say, well, I've got church out there on the river. I lived that lie for a long time. It's a lie. <laughs> and it's a lack of faith because what happens is the folks that say that, like I used to say, think that salvation brings bondage where it brings freedom. Amen. I don't want to follow those church rules, this and that. There's none of that. There's freedom. The shackles and chains they used to wear, are, they're on the bottom of the Trinity River now. Yeah. You know, because Jesus is all about the freedom. And he's given us, God's given us that choice. He said, accept me by faith or deny me. The choice is yours. There's eternal life either way. Eternal life with me and all the inheritance or eternal life in hell with all that inheritance, which is not as good. Where the worms never die and your flesh never dies. Think about that. Uh, unbelief, let's see. Un, the unbelief and the faith he's talking about. These were the branches that were broken off and others grafted in are based solely on the issue of faith. Not of race, ethnicity, social or intellectual background, or external morality. Salvation is always by faith alone. Amen. It's not who's got the biggest bank account, who's got the most toys. God doesn't care because he made it all anyway. He wants us by faith. In Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. 
for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, when he says, it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. There's no restrictions there. That lie that I used to believe about the restrictions of church and everything else and of salvation, just proved me wrong. Proves everybody else wrong. Well, I can't do what I want to. Well, I do more than what I want to now. You know, because I can glorify it in Jesus Christ. You know, and he talks about I had a bunch more verses, and but we're not going to get to them. Write this one down, though. Hebrews 3, 16 through 19. Read that one at a later date. And he talks about fear. Think about that. Fear. God will judge the church. Just as He surely judged Israel. You can go to Revelations and find proof of that right there. And, and Paul's telling these people, look, they're trying to, they've got this attitude, well, look at us, we're better than them. <laughs> I got all that and didn't have to go through all that law stuff that y'all do it. I just got grafted in, I'm good. Nope. And he says he did not spare. If Israel, the natural broken branches, his chosen people, was not spared, despite being God's covenant nation... Why should Gentiles, strangers to God's covenant, expect to be spared if they sin against the truths of the gospel? See, that's where a lot of folks have it wrong. They come along and say, oh, I go to church, I do this and that, I, I believe this and that, but nothing changes. We just play in church. If you play in church, maybe you're one of those that... Look at me, brother Jim. I've got my Bible, my three-piece seat. Good to see you. Love to see you. Great sermon. Let me get out of here so I can go watch and do whatever I want to. And try to live that second life. It don't work. Because guess what? You can fool the pastor, but you can't fool God. It, it, don't, it don't work. It don't work. I'm sorry. In, in 2 Timothy 19 through 24. 2 Timothy 19 through 21, excuse me. Second Timothy 2, 19 through 21, pardon me. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there is not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. That's what God's asking for today. We were, I was once a vessel of dishonor. But he is, he's changed that through the blood of Jesus Christ. I, there's a lot of folks out there shaking their head at this old redneck standing up here right now. But I'm sorry, it's not me, it's God. And God can use anyone and anybody. You have to make yourself available. Because face it, he does not, once you come to salvation, he doesn't come up to you and say, you have to do this. He'll let you know. But it's up to you, just like salvation, to make that decision. He will make you uncomfortable. But it's up to you still. On to verse 22. Whew. I'm going to run out of time, I can tell you folks. That's all right. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise, you also will be cut off. Okay, before y'all, a lot of folks jump ahead and say, oh, he's talking about you can lose your salvation. Yeah. It's not what we're talking about. We'll put that to bed. Right. Consider the goodness and the severity. 
All of God's attributes work in harmony. There's no conflict between his goodness and love and his justice and wrath. Those who accept his gracious offer of salvation experience his goodness. But those who reject it experience his severity. In Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, tell us a little bit of that. I want you to listen to this first verse. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. It says it right there. Inexcusable. He gives you the choice. No excuse. You can't say, I didn't know. You had the choice. You had the choice. He talks about a hardness, hardness there too that we're going to get to in a little while. Hardness of heart. Whew. It's, uh, I'm going to jump ahead. And then to those who, felt, who fall. The unbelieving Jews described in verses uh, 12 through 21 and the word, the Greek word "fell" translated in the Greek means to means to fall, so as to be completely ruined, complete ruination, completely shot when you fall. No turning back. Those who reject God's salvation fall into spiritual ruin. And then he says, "If you continue." But genuine faith always perseveres. In Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. This lines up with a lot of, a lot of Scripture. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you in an, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence <clears throat> steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the re rebellion. Do not harden your hearts. Think about that. And doesn't that sound similar to the parable of the three soils? Think about it. Where the soil, the, the seed fell on the stony, rocky soil, the seed that fell on the good soil was able to take deep root and grow. And then it says, cut off. Hmm. God will deal swiftly and severely with those who reject Him. Me and God had to talk about that. Because uh, his swiftly and severely, it's not on my time. You know, because we, all, we all see things that happens with people and go, oh man, how? And they just continue and continue and continue. I was one of them. Continued and continued. Until finally, he got a hold of me the hard way. And he made his point known. He didn't give up. So a lot of times we need to just do what we need to do is pray. Just pray. And then in verses uh, 23 and 24. 
And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Wow. Mmm. Damn. And think about this is this is some prophecy kind of going on. In the future, Israel will repent of unbelief and accept embrace the Messiah in the terms of Paul's message. And at that time, God will gladly graft them in. I think that I glad we can't have words for the, the joy that he's gonna be able to do that. You know, his chosen people that have rebelled and rebelled against him and hardened their heart and they're finally and I can't remember the verse where he says you know how often I've wanted to gather underneath under my wings like chicks and he's watched as, as we as parents have experienced kind of just a little glimmer of the same thing as our children go astray or do this and we want to bring them back and they just keep going and I might we don't give up when we finally say okay you got to take your bumps and bruises because you're not going to listen to me. And finally, they return and just the, the homecoming, just like the uh, prodigal son. Oh, break out the best. Here comes my son. Kill the fatted calf. Bring the robes, the rings. Oh, man, let's celebrate. Amen. I believe that's just a, just a small portion of the joy that God's showing them. Here they come again, my, my, my chosen people coming back to me. You know, God, when he, they grafted contrary to nature. We were contrary to nature. Think about that. By God's grace alone, while we grafted in. And sometimes, you know, I don't think we understand the depth of that word, grace. It's such a small word, but so life-changing. And so, sometimes so easily just uh, taken for granted. Brother Jim was talking about this morning. It just, sometimes we, like Paul says, uh, maybe abuse grace. Oh, come back to that point where... You remember when you got saved? The the birds chirped louder and sweeter. The sun shone brighter and all that. Every day that we wake up, it should be like it. Because God promised us, Jesus promised us an abundant life. You know, and that, a lot of the folks that get that abundant life screwed up. It's it's more about what's in my back pocket or my bank account or the, what kind of truck... It's what I see right here in, in my church family right there and church family beyond these walls and everything else. That It's just amazing. It's amazing. And you know, it's that grace that sustains you through the times of tribulation when you're having family troubles, health troubles, whatever. That grace is what sustains us. And that grace alone. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 13... Mm. There, never mind I've got that one moving on right along <laughs> verse 25 for I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel into the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Amen. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Mystery. That one, that little word. We're not talking about a murder she wrote, murder mystery on TV. The word is re used to refer to a New Testament truth previously not revealed. This mystery has two parts he's talking about. One... Israel has experienced a partial spiritual hardening. They've hardened their heart against God. 
We hear about hardened hearts a lot in this book. And every time you hear about a hardened heart, we should take it to take it to heart and examine our heart because that's the easiest thing to do is start building those walls up around your heart, blocking God out, and letting the flesh reign. It doesn't work. And number two, that this hardening he's talking about will only last for a divinely specified period of time. Nobody knows but God. In Romans 16, 25 through 27. Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest. And by the prophet, prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for the obedience to the faith. Wow. And he talks about wise in your own opinion. Woo! That's a downfall for many of us. You know, because I, I don't know about y'all, but I've been getting about that. I used to tell my wife, you know, I'm smarter than... I give myself anybody knows and all that. It's an easy, easy trap to fall into. And it's a downfall, many, but it's another warning against a spiritual pride and arrogance. Let's face it. The only way God can talk to us and work to us is being humble. Think about it. Complete opposite of prideful. You know, uh, a lot of people, they, I can't remember how this is actually said, but a lot of folks measure their stature by their height. God sees us by when our biggest when we're on our knees before Him. There's no shame in humble. You know, a lot of us men, myself included, used to, you say, oh man, you can't be a man if you cry. I'm not ashamed to cry with God or for anybody else anymore. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And then He talks about the blindness in part. Well, when your heart's hardened, you're spiritually blind. Just proven fact. You can't see what's what God has in store. But this blindness he's talking about, the nation's blindness, does not extend to each individual Jew. See, throughout all history, when Israel hardened their heart, God always had a preserve, preserved a believing remnant. Perfect example is the flood. You know, there's Noah, but there's example after example after example all day. He is, he loved, he loved his his people, which we are grafted into now. We are his people. He loved Israel so much. He said, "I'm gonna provide a way to keep from you." But think about this, because we know even how our hearts break when our children stray and maybe don't come back. Think about how God feels when those branches are broken off and they are cast in the fire. That was my, that was my son. That was my son. Think about that. Because it's, Jesus died for all, right? Amen. All means all, even for the sinner. That doesn't mean they're going to heaven. They have to have that faith that we're talking about. But can you imagine how he feels, you know, my, what I went through, what I did for you to take all the sins of the world. And you said, no. And it just, it breaks my heart. And then he talks about until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now this, it's referring to a specific point in time. We don't know when it is, but we know what it refers to because it's referring to the uh, fullness refers to completion that has come in translates as a gr uh, grief word. It's tr it up. One moment, please. <laughs> fullness refers to completion. The completion has come in. And it translates a Greek verb often used to speak of, of the coming salvation. 
Okay? Now, Israel's spiritual hardening, hardening, which we're just going to just begins with the rejecting of Jesus, will last only until the last Gentile saved. Think about that. The grafted folks, us, that's when God said, that's when the bell tolls, basically. That's when I'm calling you home. When that last person, which could be, who knows, next two minutes, next 20 years, but that's when he's saying, y'all come home. Y'all come home. Okay? Verses 26 and 27. So all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Right there in verse 26, it says, So all Israel, they're going to come. All Israel that believes will come. You know, all the elect Jewish people alive at the end of the tribulation, not the believing Jews at that time within the church, because obviously they're believing. They don't, they're, we're not focused on them. And think about it at the covenant, the new covenant, which they had said, uh uh, I've got the law. What's this? Because that's my tradition. I've got the law from my daddy Abraham. Yep, he passed it down to me. But now they've come, the blinders have been taken off. The foreskin of their hearts has been cut away. The walls are tumbling down, just like when we come to salvation. I don't know about you, but there's a time of weeping when you come to salvation. I did. You, that flood of grief and that flood of joy all combined at the same time. That's, that's the only way I can describe it. That's the way the nation, the believing nation of Israel is going to be. Oh, man, can you imagine? You know, I was raised up. Great grandpa Levit Leviticus or whatever. You know, he, he taught me the law and I was handed down and all of a sudden the blinders are off. The hearts open. Can you imagine how that would feel? Woo! I get, I get shivers. And then he says, I take away their sins. It's a prerequisite of salvation. All do by faith in Jesus, right? Like Jim was saying this morning, when you baptism, you go in there and you've got that covering. And something my Sunday school class has heard before, I call it Teflon coat. Nothing sticks. God loves me so much. Jesus loved me so much. When He cleansed me, put me down there, He put that Teflon coat. And it doesn't matter what the devil throws at me. It can't stick. I don't have to do that. I can turn it away. Yep. And you know, it's that comes with the faith of Jesus' death and His resurrection. You know, without the... There's a group of people there, the Sadducees, obviously, that didn't believe in that. But without the resurrection, the death is meaningless, right? Doesn't matter. Without the, resur without the death... My sin still hanging on the cross. Doesn't, doesn't work. In verses uh, 28 and 29. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But con concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Wow. Gospel enemies. That's Israel's temporal, temporary situation during a time of spiritual hardening. I'll ask you. Are we gospel enemies sometimes? Sometimes do we... You know, you're either for Him or you're against Him. There's no middle ground. And sometimes... Brother Jim, I don't know how this all works out, but how it all, all God puts it together... You're either going forward or you're going backwards. It doesn't. You got to have your foot on the gas. Because there's there's no sitting still. Like I say, it's it's forward or, or backwards. 
And you know, this time of temporary hardening, I've ta- I get to talk to a lot of folks, and a lot of folks says, well, I'm not quite ready to that salvation stuff yet to hear all about that or anything else like that. It tells us no man knows the time. We just talked about that. You know, these guys that I talked to, they, well, maybe when the fish stop biting, the river goes down. What if? Well, what if it don't? I'll catch more fish. But if it doesn't, you find yourself in eternal hell. Sorry. Like I say, my heart breaks for it. And then it talks about concerning the election. You know, a lot of people have struggle with God's just elected these few to go to heaven. That doesn't seem like a fair God. Well, let me tell you, that's God's knowledge, all-knowing, foreseeing knowledge of knowing who will believe and who won't and who will have faith and who won't. It's not about Him saying, well, I didn't think, well, Miss, Miss Page, I just missed her. No, no, no. God knows who will and who won't. Before the foundations of the earth were built, all three of them made the agreement that Those are the ones that will. These are the ones that won't. Okay? And then he talks about the gifts are irrevocable. You know, God's election of believers is unconditional and unchangeable. That psalm says, come as you are. That's what it means. Come as you are. That's how he wants us. You know, it's just like Brother Jim was talking about that seed this morning. You plant that seed, and it's going to grow into something bigger and better than it was. That's what God does in in our life with those gifts, if we allow Him. And it's unchangeable and unconditional because of His nature. Think about His nature. Love is overwhelming, right? Because look at the grace. I didn't deserve grace. I didn't deserve for Jesus to be crucified and hang on there. But he said, yes, I am. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And I want want to tell you, if you think you're, you're not deserving, that's just the enemy whispering in your ear trying to bring up crud. And he continues, you know, when he talks the gifts, the gifts, the gifts. And like I said, we've talked about inheritances. All that is given to Jesus, he said, is is ours. Like I say, heaven, riches that we can't explain. And I'm not talking about money. Well, heck, it's it's gonna be commonplace for us to walk down the streets of gold and go into my mansion and see all these pearl giant pearls and everything else. So Money is not an object, and that's going to be the farthest thing for our mind. Just to be able to sit in the love of Jesus and lit up by God. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Then verses in 30 and 32. My gosh, we're going to finish up today. It's amazing. For For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now obtain mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been <clears throat> excuse me, let me start. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Mm. God will extend his grace and mercy to unbelieving Israel, just as he d- did to the unbelieving Gentiles. Salvation, whether to Jew or Greek, flows from God's mercy. Think about that. We didn't do anything to deserve it. There's not a man alive that did, or a woman alive. We, we, we can't live a good enough life to line up. You know, though not the author of sin, God allowed it, right? 
He allowed man to pursue his sinful inclinations. So what? Why? So God could receive the glory by demonstrating his grace and his mercy to disobedient sinners. Think about that. Yeah, Adam goofed up. We, there would have been a life of, he had a life of no sin. He had everything to look forward to. But God had bigger things in store. He said, you know, I know what Adam's going to do. I've made provisions already. I love him so much that I'm going to provide this grace and this mercy to disobedient sinners that don't deserve it to show you how much I love you. And he did so at a price. I want you to think about what did Jesus do to deserve what he got? Nothing, right? He did it for a reason. To glorify God and to save us. Mm. You know, I've asked uh, a lot of folks, you know, do you... I could, I could die for my daughter, probably, you know, my wife. But Carmen, I'm sorry if it was between <laughs> you and me. If, uh, I love you, baby. <laughs> I'll say a few words at your funeral, but, uh, you know, but I, I couldn't do it. But that's, that's the human side of it, you know. We, that's basically everybody in this room, you know. we got to be real. But Jesus said, ah, I'll do it for them all. Daddy, I'll take care of them all. You know, they can't do it on their own, Daddy. I got this for them. I got this for them. And he did. And he didn't hesitate. The, the saddest thing to me when he, before he, he made that sacrifice, and I've said this before, and this is, this, I don't know why, but this made the biggest impact in my life. When John, your brother John was there, and uh, he said, when he looked in that cup and Jesus was in the garden, he said, there's that cup full of sin. My sin was right there on top. And he said, I'll do it. I'll do it. Boy, it just it cuts me to the core every time. In Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 6. We're going to close with this. Let no one deceive you with these empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You should think about that. We've talked a lot about grace. A lot about mercy. But also, being a just and fair God comes wrath with disobedience. You know, sometimes we uh, get too wrapped up. Well, He's a just loving God and graceful and merciful. Yes, He is. But also, it says right here, those that do not believe, He will pour His wrath out on. And it's just as immeasurable as His grace and mercy so is his wrath. I mean, I, we just we just see tidbits of it with the uh, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood, you know, just tiny tidbits of what his wrath is. You know, we we sit, we get a hurricane hits the Gulf Coast. It's terrible. Don't don't get me wrong, but that's not even a, <laughs> some uh, my old East Texas terminology is. That's not a pimple on a gnat's behind. So, God wants us to fear Him. He wants us to love Him. And if we are His, we have no problem. We can fall on that. But if you don't, prepare for the worst. Thank y'all for your time today. We're going to close in prayer. I hope y'all learn something. I know I do every time I open the book. Father, I thank you for this day again. Father, I thank you for the opportunity just to study your word, Father. And I thank you for this, oh, this group of believers that means so much to me. We just pray today that uh, our hearts be tender, that the walls of our hearts be knocked down, Father, that we just take in your word, Father. Not just today, but every day, to come closer, to draw closer to you, Father, to guide us and let the Holy Spirit just show us the way, Father. Bless us for this time and just prepare us for what you have in store. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.